Thanks for checking out this movie review video. This is for the 1972 Italian giallo film Seven Bloodstained Orchids, which I watched on Blu-ray, obviously. Now, this is my very first Umberto Lenzi-directed giallo film, and if you're into giallo, not only this review, just know that I have an entire playlist of giallo film reviews on my channel. I think this will be my 31st to be added there, so... Now, this one isn't going to rank into my top ones because I've been keeping kind of a ranked list for myself of, like, my top Giallo films. It doesn't rank into my top. Uh, it actually ranks more towards my bottom of the list, but I still like it. And that's one of the things is that even Giallo that I'm consuming now that's not – that ranks at the bottom of my list is still worth watching and still fun and interesting because if you, you consider it, films like this – to still be available now so many decades later, and the fact that they're from Italy, uh, really only the decent to good ones survive, pretty much. So, uh, I'm sure there are other ways you can find, you know, ones that are super crappy, but I don't know if I'm going into that quite yet, maybe at some point. So anyway, like I said, from 1972, uh, directed by Umberto Lenzi, who also did the films Orgasmo, So Sweet, So Perverse, A Quiet Place to Kill, Knife of Ice, Spasmo, Eyeball, Eaten Alive, Cannibal Ferro, Ghost House, and Hitcher in the Dark, just to name some. A bunch of those are giallos that I will actually be reviewing too, because I have the Lindsay Baker set from Severin. So I'm going to be getting into those actually pretty soon. Uh, the script was written by Lindsay and also Roberto Gianviti, who also worked on scripts for The, the Conspiracy of Torture a Lizard in a Woman's Skin, which is quite a good one. I have a review for on my channel. Don't Torture a Duckling, also have a review for that. Five Women for the Killer, that's another one. And the story for this film was actually taken from a novel by Cornwall, or I'm sorry, Cornell Wool Woolrich, who also had uh, material taken from some of his novels that turned into the movies Rear Window, Cloak and Dagger, and Original Sin, which I thought was very, very interesting. So, Rosella Falk is in this film as Elena. She's the one in the Mental Institute. Um, she was also in the film The Fifth Chord and The Black Belly of the Tarantula the year prior to this film. Both of those giallos, and I have reviews for both of those. Um, and then was in The Killer is on the Phone the same year as this film, Seven Bloodstained Orchids. So, I thought that was interesting to throw out there. She does a good job, too. She's a good actress. Now, Bruno Corazari, who plays Barrett in this film, uh, was in The Strange Vice of Mrs. Ward just the year prior, which is a really awesome Giallo film. If you have not seen it, you should definitely see it, especially if you like Giallo. It's a very good one. So the opening music for this is kind of light and funky, but it actually has a little touch of this kind of like dark foreboding aspect at the same time, and I really like that. In general... I like the music in this film a lot. A lot of the Giallo films have like really funky, fun music to them. Not all of them, though. Uh, but this particular score for this one, quite good. Really enjoyed it. Would be interested to potentially listen to it on Spotify. I might one day. thought it was fun. A lot of cool funkiness to it, which is kind of one of the things I look for in you know the scores for Giallo films. So starting with the killer in this one, I think is a really good way to kind of hit the ground running with the film. You start by following the killer, obviously. And I particularly like that one shot, that camera shot where his car's pulling up and it's like the camera's on like kind of the street level and the grill of the car comes like right up to the camera and then stops. I thought that was a really cool shot. Um, but following the killer as he's breaking into the house and obviously he you know, the flick of his switchblade coming out on screen, very cool as well. Not just for the look, but the sound of it. And then he breaks into that woman's house, and you don't really know what's going on because it's like he's going to kill the woman who's in bed there, and then he doesn't, and then he pans over to a picture of a woman on the bedside table next to her, and then that person ends up getting killed right after. Now, that's the woman who was working as a prostitute who then gets beaten to death out in that kind of like field area with just a big piece of wood, which is a brutal killing. And once again, another way to really, you know, keep the film going, hit the ground running, I thought that was pretty good, but the aspect of him breaking into that house and then it, you know, having that intentional pan over to the picture of the woman gives you the idea that he's searching for someone in particular 
the killer. And this isn't just kind of like indiscriminate killing, which, you know, knowing it's a giallo film, usually there is a very pointed reason that the people being killed are being killed. So, although I'm sure there are some giallo out there where it's more random, but yeah. Uh, and then the little aspect of the killer leaving those little um, silver half moons, which we realize, find out later, are fr were Frank's. It was uh, a moon that Frank Saunders had been given, which I guess was like a keychain, had been given by his brother, who I believe was named Fred Saunders, because of what that dude Raphael said, who had who had the uh, photographic memory. Um, yeah, I think that's supposed to be a hint, by the way, like that little moment where he's like, oh, I remember the guy, it's Fred Saunders. And then Mario's like, um, your memory must be off because it's Frank Saunders. No, photographic memory, Raphael was right. It's the idea that it, it was the brother coming back to try and kill the woman who left his brother Frank to bleed out and die in that car crash. Uh, and he assumed that it was one of seven women who he had pulled off of the uh, hotel register. And so he was like, I don't know which one it is. So guess what? I'm just going to kill them all to cover all my bases and make sure I killed the woman who basically killed my brother. So, I mean, not the best logic, especially not for someone who's a priest, like we find out in the end. But, you know. Uh, it... <laughs> The shot of paint dripping on Kathy's body. Now, she was the second one to actually be killed. Um, she was the one who had the cats. Uh, when she finally gets killed, she gets strangled. First of all, it's a nice kind of brutal killing that pops up and, and has a good kind of jump scare factor to it. But when they're showing her body as she's naked laying on the ground and there's paint kind of dripping on her body on top of the blood that's there... Not only is it just a cool visual because of the way they shot it, but it's kind of cool because it indicates that the killing is basically a piece of the killer's artwork in a sense. And that basically her dead body is the canvas and her blood is the paint in essence. And I kind of like that tie in there. Um, works really well. Uh, three supposed kills, because there's the two actual kills initially, and then what you think initially is a kill of Julia, but then find out she actually survived, but they're, you know, keeping under wraps that she survived. So it seems like three kills within the first 15 minutes of the film. That's what I mean about, like, really getting, you know, hitting the ground running. And that kind of actually speaks to another aspect of this film that I think is great, is the pacing is so good. This movie just moves, 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 moves. I never felt like there were any times really where I was sitting there and was like, okay, can we get going here? Like, let's let's pick up the pace. Because a lot of Giallo films, even though they're all interesting to me, or, or at least the ones I've seen, they a lot of them have a tendency to have like these big lulls in the in the pacing of the film. Like it's really starts to slow down. They focus on these kind of weird, odd things that don't really matter that much. But this one, I felt like it's edited really well and the pacing is just like boom, 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 boom. Really moving. And that makes the runtime of it move pretty well, which is about an hour and a half. So pretty awesome. When Mario goes over the photos of the men who attended Julia's funeral, you know, fake funeral with the police, he stated that one man, like, just offhanded, like, kind of dismissively, was like, one man, he's just like, oh, distant relative. Now, that made me think that it was kind of this quick nod to who the actual killer was as, like, a very quick introduction, but it ended up not being right. Um, I had another moment like that, which I'll talk about in a little bit, but where I w was guessing and was wrong, but, I mean, when I'm watching these movies, like, everyone looks suspicious to me. I'm just like... All right, could it be this person? Do they have motive? <laughs> what is their situation in this film? Let's let's figure that out. Uh, it's a cool setup with discovering there will be seven victims and they're somehow connected uh, through the hotel register. That that's basically how they figure it out. They basically say like there will be potentially seven kills. So you as an audience member are like, okay, you know, three down, three down. If the killer doesn't figure out that Julia is still alive four more to go. So I kind of like that as an audience member, you can kind of like tick it off a sheet in essence and be like, okay, now we got four kills. Now we got five kills, got two more to go. So I thought that was cool. Elena's paranoia uh, being shown in the mental institution seemed like a setup 
um, so that nobody would actually believe her when she was in actual danger, which obviously that's what ends up happening. The killer comes for her and she's, you know, been established as someone who's just always paranoid and thinking everyone's after her and just yelling and screaming about it all the time. So since that track's already been laid, once she starts screaming and yelling, no one comes to her aid and no one will come to her aid. And they even have the scene of the nurse basically being like, oh, she's at it again. And meanwhile, she actually gets killed, which, by the way, how bad would that nurse feel? Think about that. Speaking of Elena, I like when she faints from seeing the killer, because not just because she faints from seeing the killer and then she's drowned, which I think is kind of an interesting kill. But what I like most about that is the shot, like the camera shot. It has the gloved killer's hands on the sides and you're seeing her between the hands. And then she faints. It just looks cool. Like, this is how it's framed. It looks really good. I, I quite enjoy it. Based on the scene at the mental institution, the killer is pretty athletic. That's one thing I picked up on. He had a really impressive escape after he, you know, slashed Mario's arm when they were there. Um, he, like, jumped out a window and was, like, on the roof and then jumped down from that. Like, there was a lot of acrobatic stuff basically going on. And I'm like, okay, it can't be someone who's, like, old or, you know, unathletic. So these are the kind of, like, little bits of clues you look for as an audience member to try and figure out who did it. But there were a lot of athletic people in the film or, you know, relatively fit people in the film. So it was kind of like, eh. Here, let me see if I can fix the... As lighting gets off every now and then, sorry. It's pretty random that the one old guy suggests Mario check where the painters, hippies, and vagabonds hang out to uh, to find out about, I think that was when he was trying to find out about Frank Saunders. Because um, he was checking churches. Like, he had been checking churches, and then that one dude was like, hey, why don't you check where the hippies, uh, what do you say, the, what was it again? The hippies, painters, hippies, and vagabonds hang out. Obviously, because it was in the script, he goes there and he gets a lead that he was looking for. I think that's what leads him to bear it initially. Um, which, by the way, the shot following Mario into the party at Barrett's house, I thought was really cool. Just the movement of how it went with him. It goes through like that um, that barrier in the walkway of the beads. And then it comes around and it kind of like pans around. Like it follows him in and then it like looks around. The camera work in this film is really good. So the directing, I quite like. The cinematography is really nice. Just a lot of these camera movements, super cool. A lot of fluid movements of the camera throughout the entire film that just look great. I mean, visually, it's it's quite nice. That's one of the things I like about the Giallo films in general. A lot of them have a really nice aesthetic to them. I find the shots of Raphael and Barrett looking suspiciously into the camera pretty funny. Both of them have those moments where it's just them looking into the camera and they're like, like one of those things. I, You know, obviously it's over the top, but, you know, this is the 70s. They kind of did stuff like that. Wasn't really considered over the top then, but it's funny now. The tidbit about Frank Saunders dying in a car accident because the woman driver left him to die creates an interesting aspect of a potential motive. And obviously in the end that ends up being the motive. So when I was watching it and I didn't know who the killer was, they talked about that and I was like, that does seem like probably the motive. Cause they made a very big point of talking about that with the police. Can you actually tell a drug by sniffing a needle? Seems kind of absurd to me. When Mario goes back to Barrett's place and he's, and Barrett's like ODing on, on whatever, I think it was heroin was in the needle. And like Mario picks up the needle and is like sniffing it. And he's like morphine. It's like, um, you can't tell drugs by sniffing a needle, I don't think. Uh, but I thought that, you know, just another one of those quirky, weird things that's funny in the film to me. The drill killing in this is pretty gnarly for, for the time that it came out, all things considered. I thought it was good. I didn't I didn't expect that they would really show the drill like going in and blood like spurting out. That's probably the best kill in the film in my opinion. Uh, although like the beating with the piece of wood early on was pretty brutal as well. The slow scene of Julia alone in the house after Mario's arrest or faked arrest basically builds good tension, uh, especially with the constant clicking or ticking of the clock in the background. Um, it's kind of makes that uh, feeling like her time's running out as you keep hearing 
nothing but the ticking of the clock. Uh, it helps kind of drive the tension up, and then you feel like any minute now, tick, 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 here comes the killer for her. Like, you can feel it coming. And, uh, yeah, it's a good scene for that reason. As soon as Barrett was found dead, it looked like he had hung himself, um, I suspected that potentially the killer was the guy who was with him when Mario had gone back to his place and sniffed the needle. So I was like, oh, maybe that's it. Because it didn't seem like he would have actually killed himself. And then I thought back and I'm like, well, maybe when he was ODing, he didn't inject himself. That guy who was with him had actually done it. I think I would have liked if they went down that path, but they didn't. So, just saying. The uh, Oh, yeah, and then this quote about the suicide of Barrett. His suicide was his confession. I do think that's a good line. Like, it sounds good. It's kind of, it plays well. But it's also, like, really absurd and kind of goes with something that you see in Giallo quite a bit, which is the police being super lazy and just being like, oh, there's this one bit of evidence, case closed, we're done. We don't really care that much. Like, they're bumbling, they're not that smart, they just quit pretty easily. That's that's a theme in Giallo, pretty much. So, in the end, I believe it was the Inez uh, was the driver who ended up leaving Frank for dead, and the Half Moons were the keychain that Frank had that was given to him by his brother. Yes, so this whole time we're just trying to figure out who is the American man, and in the end, it is the priest, it is Fred Saunders, his brother, and he's just... Hell bent on revenge. Uh, I like the revenge aspect, but I don't know. I do feel like the ending just kind of like had a little bit of a whimpering finish to it, in my opinion. I don't know. Um, then I had this question of, of this. When the killer is then going after Julia for the second time, why is he coming after her in his priest outfit? Because if he's smart, which obviously he's not in this, he would know if it doesn't work out and I'm not able to kill her again, I shouldn't be wearing the clothes of the profession that I'm in because then people will be coming looking for priests and then they may find me. Like, he should be disguised. So I kind of think that's ridiculous. That's obviously something that was missed in the script writing of the story, but, you know, another quirky thing. Go figure. Frank's brother figured he's just he'll just kill every woman uh, that, that it could have been who left his brother to die. What a crazy dude. Yeah, that's one of those things where I think it, it, it becomes a thing where it's he's driven by the revenge initially, and then he becomes so focused on the idea of killing and actually starts to like the killing that he just justifies to himself, well, I guess I should just kill all these women. So it's not really as much about the revenge anymore. It's more about his satisfaction with actually killing women. Like, he you can tell in this, like, he's into it, he's down with it, and he's using the revenge for his brother as a way to do more killing, basically. So, obviously there's an irony uh, of the brother, the killer, being a priest, and then becoming an insane killer, that whole thing where, you know, people who are of the cloth are supposed to be all high and mighty and so, so good, and obviously this guy is totally the opposite of that he's the worst you could possibly be not only is he a murderer he's a serial killer he murders many people and who knows if he wasn't caught would would he have kept going quite possibly there are a lot of good looking smooth shots and pans um and they the, another thing to point out about that i know i already talked about that but there's a lot of cool ones where it kind of like starts with one focal point and then kind of like smoothly moves over and focuses on another focal point in the scene like those camera movements, quite like them. The score is a good time, like I said, but it bears repeating. Funky and fun, I really like the score for this one. And the pacing, bears repeating again. Great pacing, it just moves. It's at such a good clip. Okay, so overall, I said this wasn't one of my favorites. Uh, it is pretty solid, though. I do enjoy it. So out of five stars with half stars in play, I'm going to give it a very solid three-star rating, I was between three and three and a half, but I think it feels more right at the three-star rating. So, would love to hear your thoughts on Seven Bloodstained Orchids down below. Oh, and one thing to point out is, like, this is weird, because it's Seven Bloodstained Orchids, orchids and Bloodstained, there's no hyphen in here. But on the title screen for this, there is a hyphen, and on IMDb, there is a hyphen. So, I don't understand why there isn't one on the front. I don't know. It's just a, it's a, it's a very small thing, but... Just thought I'd bring it up. But 
Give me your thoughts on this film or any Giallo in general, because obviously I love to talk about Giallo. And like I said, check out the other Giallo reviews I have because I have an entire um, playlist. And I think I might actually create a whole playlist for Umberto Lenzi as well, because uh, like I said, I'm going to be watching at least four more of his Giallo films. So I might do that as well, because I already have ones for like Argento and Fulci and Mario Bava. So I'll probably do that. But anyway, uh, do me a quick favor. Hit that subscribe button if you like this video or any video I've ever done because that is how you support me. That is how you help me grow this horror community right here. I'm not getting paid to do this. I'm just doing it for the love of horror and, like I said, trying to grow like a nerdy horror community, especially at the moment to talk about Giallo. But, you know, my tastes change as time goes on. But anyway, hit that subscribe button and also hit the notification bell. Because then that way you'll know whenever I'm putting up a new video, whether it's a review like this or an unboxing or a haul video or something else. Um, yeah. Anyway, thanks for check checking this out and taking your time to do that. And until next time, keep it brutal.